Right now, I'm standing in front of the Plimco Dam. This is the last dam on this small brook system leading up to a 269 acre river herring spawning habitat. My name is Eric Hutchins. I'm with the National Marine Fisheries Service. These fish live at sea for three to four years until they're old enough to spawn. They return to the river systems and in they come in waves into the spawning habitat. River herring, unlike salmon, seldom ever break the surface of the water. They need to stay in the water column. They can go up steep stuff, up to sometimes 18 inches, and through some fast water, but they don't jump. And if you've got a place that's got too much turbulence, that's an impediment, that can hold them back. And certainly right here, there's no chance for them to make it up through this. Every river in the Atlantic coast is littered with these abandoned industrial age dams. I am Peter Shelley. I'm senior counsel with the Conservation Law Foundation. At the time, uh, they made a lot of sense. You know, th those dams were responsible for the birth of this country in a lot of ways. Um, their function is no longer necessary. It is the highest priority for river herring getting rid of these dams, just removing them. Oh, there's another over here. So what we're going to do today is we're going to put a net in here and bucket some of them around and give these guys a free ride. You know, one of the big challenges is we're spending hundreds of millions of federal dollars as well as millions of hours of volunteer effort restoring these herring runs. But these fish go back out to sea and uh, there they're subject to being caught in the sea herring fishery. And a lot of these efforts are wasted. Look at all these. This is a megalode. <laughs> Virtually every place where dams have been removed, the numbers of river herring multiply. I'm John Bullard. I'm the Regional Administrator for the Greater Atlantic Fisheries Office of NOAA Fisheries. But we have to solve the problem at sea as well. You need to know how many are out there to base the limits or quotas on how much can be caught. And then you need to be able to enforce or observe how much they are catching. We are pushing all three of these as hard as, as we can. Basically, my job is how do you have both fish and fishermen? Working waterfronts are really special. We send our people to sea. We've always sent our people to sea with a purpose. Fishing's a purpose. For someone who owns a fishing boat, their time scale is this week, maybe next week, but certainly by the next mortgage payment, which means they gotta catch fish. But the health of the fishery depends on a longer time scale. Because of mismanagement, because of a failure, really, by the federal government and the fishery managers, many of whom are fishermen, we have had decades of over-harvesting. And we have built a fleet that is many times bigger and more powerful than the ability of Mother Nature to sustainably produce fish. Everyone wants to see jobs created and everyone wants to see a healthy resource. Fishery management is incredibly complex. The art and the science of passing fish on the East Coast is fairly new. I'm Bill McGuire, I'm the coordinator for the Herring Lift on the Saugatucket River in Wakefield, Rhode Island. A fish ladder is, is just a, a graduated passageway with, with barriers to try to slow the water and also those barriers will give the fish a place to rest behind sometimes. It was built for Atlantic salmon. These herring do not have the same drive, so when the rivers are full like they are this year with a lot of rain and the velocities are high, these herring cannot go up. It's just too much water for them. This is a fast process. We're gonna move a lot of fish. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. 
<laughs> These fish have traveled thousands of miles. They've been at sea for three years. They have avoided every possible danger, net, predator. They've made it back to their natal river, the place where they were born. And now to have one dam or two dams stand in their way, people are not gonna allow that to happen. It's been a frustrating battle. We've been working for many years to try and rein in this industrial fleet of ships. Uh, my name is Peter Baker. I work for the Pew Charitable Trust, and I'm a founder and director of the Herring Alliance. So a lot of what the Herring Alliance has worked to do is make sure we have federal monitors on those boats to be able to sample what they're bringing aboard, to be able to quantify what they're killing. Unfortunately, to date, National Marine Fisheries Service hasn't uh, actually ponied up the funds and gotten the humans on every trip. So years of work has been stymied. I'd like to see us uh, solve the observer issue where the industry is paying 100% of the cost of observers at sea. I think everybody really just wants to help these guys out. They're just stuck here and they have nowhere to go. That was 3,520 fish in about 35 minutes. It's really gratifying to come out today and to see as many river herring uh, sitting in this river as, as we see. But to really bring the fish back in the numbers that they once were, or to even get close, we have to really understand, monitor, and limit the amount of river herring. They're getting killed by the industrial trawl fleet. These are difficult problems, and, and they're problems that we can make progress on. And uh, they've languished for a long yeah. time. We're tackling it here, and you're tackling it with us out at sea, and we're going to keep holding your feet to the fire. <laughs>